Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. In today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to go through object recognition and the visual ventral stream. Object recognition we can see as a high-level visual process in which we're transforming simple visual inputs about light and dark and colour into more complex object-level descriptions of where one object ends and another one begins, how we segment objects from backgrounds, but also how we link our visual percepts to background knowledge such as um, language or memory representations of objects we've encountered in the past. For this reason, the visual ventral stream is also called the what stream, because its main function is to figure out what um, particular objects are. Um, so we're translating visual images into known object entities. The visual ventral stream runs from the occipital lobes into the temporal lobes, but the temporal lobes are known to be important for tasks such as language and memory. So in this way, we're linking together visual perception with uh, other cognitive functions such as language and memory. We can contrast this route with the, uh, the dorsal stream. The dorsal stream also starts in the occipital lobes, but runs up to the parietal lobes. And here, the dorsal stream is involved in things such as attention, so selecting from objects in the visual world, and action. So linking what we see with uh, motor behaviour and linking it to the position of our body in space. There are a number of computational problems faced by the ventral stream in recognising objects, and here I'll talk about the problem of grouping and the problem of object constancy. So grouping is trying to make sense of which visual elements belong together. So for instance, if we have two different lines or two different surfaces, how do we know whether they belong to the same object or two different objects? And the answer to that is that we don't know for sure, and this is the origin of visual illusions. But what the brain does is that it makes a best guess as to how things are likely to be structured. And it does this by coming with prior assumptions about how the visual world is structured, for instance, based on previous experiences of seeing. So, for instance, if we have two surfaces of the same colour, we're likely to, to infer that they belong to the same object. And if we have two lines that carry on in parallel, maybe with an occlusion between them, we might infer that that's one object rather than two different uh, objects that happen to just coincidentally be in parallel. Object constancy refers to the fact that an object will be the same object even when it's viewed differently. So, for instance, when it's viewed in different lighting conditions or when you view it from the side versus above. So essentially the problem here is that there are an infinite number of different images in which an object such as a mug can be viewed on the retina, depending on how you look at it and how it's lit. And what the brain is having to do is say, well, this is still the same object, even though it can appear in this infinite array of different uh, images. So the brain is effectively trying to infer that this is the same object, irrespective of its size or position in space, and irrespective of incidental lighting and orientation features. And this is where things like memory of objects come into play, so that we can use our memory of what an object looks like to solve this particular problem of differences in lighting uh, and so on. One way of studying object recognition is to look at the effects of brain damage on the visual ventral stream. So patients who have problems in object recognition are said to have something called visual agnosia. And the hallmarks of visual agnosia are that when you present objects with visual images of um, objects such as birds or uh, objects around the house or typically faces, that the patient won't be able to tell you what they are. So, but they will still be able to understand the objects in terms of language, uh, for instance. And if they touch the objects, typically they would also know what they are. So what's happening here is that they're unable to um, link visual information with the stored knowledge of objects and their appearance. 
but nevertheless, in their um, language and memory systems, they still have intact knowledge uh, of those objects. So, for instance, if we take a famous case study of a case HJA, this patient, if you gave him an image of an eagle, would say, I don't know what that is, or maybe he would say it was an animal, but he wouldn't be able to, to do that. But if you ask him about what an eagle is, so you're giving it him via a spoken word, he would say that's a bird, that's a carnival, and be able to give you these kinds of descriptions. What's also perhaps more puzzling is that if you give him an image, um, a line drawing, for instance, of an eagle, even though he can't tell you what it is, he would be able to copy that drawing. Now, how can he copy the drawing if he can't see it? Well, of course, at one level, he can see it. What he can do is that he can see the particular lines and edges, because these are coded by early uh, regions in the brain, early visual processes such as in V1 and V2 and so on. But what he can't do is he can't integrate these different lines together to create a, a composite picture uh, that you need in order to identify it. So this case study has been labelled as to see but not to see, because at some level he has basic visual abilities, but those visual abilities uh, cannot be uh, integrated together to enable object recognition. We can study object constancy in the brain using fMRI. Here one paradigm that's been useful is to use MRI bold adaptation. Here what you do is that you can present images of the same object on two particular occasions. And what you find is that the brain will produce a lower bold response on the second occasion if it treats the object as being the same as the first occasion. And this is what's called adaptation or priming. So for instance, if we present two identical images at time one and time two, then we would find that the bold response is lower on time two. But what about object constancy? So here what we can do is we can present two images that vary on one dimension but not another. So, for instance, if we have two objects that vary in size, then we find that some neurons are size invariant, that is, they respond to the, uh, the same object being repeated, irrespective of whether it's the same size or not, and irrespective of whether it's presented high in the visual field or low in the visual field. And we find that neurons in the visual ventral stream, for instance in the fusiform gyrus, show this particular insensitivity. Many such regions are also insensitive to viewpoint, so they will respond, for instance, to a mug presented at time one and show adaptation to the same mug presented at time two, even if it's at a different orientation. We find this particularly in the left hemisphere, where um, the, the left fusiform shows this view insensitivity, whereas the right fusiform gyrus and to some extent the parietal lobe are sensitive uh, to viewpoint. So this suggests that there are multiple uh, brain regions that contribute to object constancy, some that care about viewpoint and some that don't care about uh, viewpoint or orientation. So far we've discussed how neurons in the visual ventral stream are tuned to particular properties of the visual world. So some neurons might um, respond more to face-like stimuli and other neurons might respond more like uh, to letter-like stimuli, such as T-junctions and so on. There's various controversial issues in the literature as to how this works exactly. So, for instance, would you ever find a neuron that responds to only one particular class of object, the so-called grandmother cells? So a hypothetical grandmother cell might respond, for instance, only to the sight of your grandmother, but not to any other face. So to what extent are the tuning of individual neurons highly specific or a bit more generic? So responding to, for instance, faces of all old people or all kinds of faces. Another issue is whether or not there are particular subregions within the visual ventral stream that become specialised for particular classes of material, such as faces, words, places uh, and so on. There is some evidence for this uh, particular position. So one line of evidence comes from uh, brain damage again. So you might have some category-specific agnosias. So for instance, patients with prosopagnosia might have problems in recognising individual faces from vision, but might have fewer problems in recognising, for instance, household objects or, or printed letters and text. Uh, 
So again, here there's some relative difficulty in uh, recognising faces from vision that, that is less apparent for other kinds of objects. Similarly, patients with uh, a condition called pure alexia may have problems in recognising printed words, but have fewer problems in recognising faces or objects. So this suggests that within the visual ventral stream, there is some degree of specialisation um, towards, for instance, faces, letters, words, and perhaps other categories such as uh, spatial scenes. We can also find this with brain imaging. Um, so, for instance, one claims that there's a region in the brain called the fusiform face area that responds far more to faces than other objects. And similarly, there might be regions called the parahippocampal place area that responds to uh, images of scenes more than faces. Whilst this is undoubtedly true, uh, the controversy is whether they respond only to faces and only to uh, places, or whether it's a more relative speci specialisation. So is the specialisation absolute or relative? And again, this is an area that is uh, under uh, investigation. One interesting question then becomes, where is this specialisation coming from? Is it something that we learn? Is it something that's innate? Is it something that everybody has? One suggestion for it um, being at least potentially innate is that we see a similar structure within the visual ventral stream in people who've been born blind. So it's not just to do with vision and it's not just to do with having visual experience. So one possibility is that it's something that is either there in kind of a blueprint for how the, uh, the brain is wired, or it's something that extends across the senses. So for instance, we can recognize objects via touch as well as via vision. And these might tend to reside in similar regions of the brain. It might also be that different kinds of objects place different kinds of demands on the visual system. So for instance, letters are very um, uh, simple uh, visual units that don't exist, for instance, in three dimensions, but have multiple parts. So recognising a word, you have multiple parts that are recognised in the serial way. Whereas a face is very different. We recognise a face not in terms of having eyes, nose and mouth, because all faces look like that. Instead, it's more subtle spatial discriminations in terms of how uh, the, these particular uh, features are, are rearranged. So again, different objects might place different uh, demands on this, and this is going to be the same for, uh, across people. Another possibility is that the uh, visual ventral stream adopts a particular kind of specialisation because of the connections that go in and out of it. So, for instance, if we take recognising written words, it's important that these connect with uh, parts of the language system involved in decoding, for instance, letters into text in order to be able to read them. Whereas, for instance, faces might connect more with parts of the brain involved in social and emotional processing, and objects might interface more with parts of the brain involved in manual actions.